The gospel has nothing. Let me repeat this. Nothing whatsoever. Nothing. Nothing to do with your suffering and sorrow. The gospel is joy unspeakable in the midst of your suffering and sorrow. It is the Holy Ghost anesthetic that will bring you through any dark night, through any desert season, through any Red Sea. Because let me tell you, you better be careful. Because if you're not, then like our hyper-Calvinist brothers, I doubt there's any in this country, like our hyper-Calvinist brothers, you start blaming God for the problems in the world. You start blaming his sovereignty in a twisted way for the, the kids suffering in Somalia, for the kid uh, who gets raped on the playground. I mean, I, I don't like to call people out by name, but we mentioned Piper earlier. He blamed God for Auschwitz. I mean, I don't, I don't worship that God. Let me tell you something. He is not the bringer of evil. He is the redeemer from evil. Amen. And let me tell you, whatever the enemy throws at you, he is going to flip it on its head for your eternal good. And that is where the sovereignty comes in. But let me tell you, he's sovereign, but he is also good. He is 100% good. Amen. This gospel is all good. This is the most unbalanced message ever to hit planet earth. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. So I want to give you a couple theological terms here. We're talking about trances. Everybody say trances. Now, these, these words are not words that are in the Bible, but they're words used to describe things that are in the Bible. Okay? Because mystical theologians have studied out trances for forever. Okay? Look, the church, drinking did not start at Toronto. Drinking did not start at Azusa Street. Okay? Uh, matter of fact, the church started in the drunken glory in Acts chapter 2. And he saved the best wine for last. Amen? And let me say this also. He doesn't, like, give you a season of renewal and then pull the rug out from under you. Like, I was in a season of renewal. Now I'm in a season of melancholy. I was in a season of revival. And now the Lord's brought me into a season of despondency. Look, renewal could be over. I'm still a closet drinker. Okay? The wine doesn't go anywhere. God doesn't go anywhere. The only thing that goes somewhere is this right here. Okay, he's always here. He never went anywhere, amen? We don't need a new Pentecost. The first one was just fine, amen? He didn't, he didn't go home. <laughs> he's been here the whole time. <laughs> you didn't know it. You thought Holy Spirit came into existence the first time you felt him and fell over in a room? <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit appeared. <laughs> Or even worse, you think you can get the Holy Spirit of God into somebody? <laughs> you think you can lift up God and throw him into somebody? <laughs> he was there long before you were, amen? <sighs> Only the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus could pull that off. But anyways, here we go. I am on a lot of rabbit trails. Uh, let's see. Bring it back to base point, Paul, right, Paul. And then we were talking about, oh, some theological words and trances. There we go. Mystical theologians. We're getting closer to it. We're getting closer to it. And then, um, where was it at? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drinking didn't start with Azusa Street. And then I was saying that, you know, he doesn't come and go. Like, we, we think of seasons in these weird old covenant type of ways and stuff. And there was one lady this one time, and uh, she was a, a prophetess, apparently. And uh, she was really having trouble because people were having more fun in my meetings than in hers. <laughs> so she released this national word, which is how you do it. And she said, next year, the wine is going to dry up. And the fire is going to come. I'm like, ooh, must be prophetess. Speaks in parables. <laughs> I was like, look, honey, I don't know where you're drinking from, but Emmanuel's veins ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I am grafted in. I am plugged in. I can't be pulled away. Amen. I'm stuck. <laughs> you are too, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not. Amen. 
So anyways, uh, yeah, so there's always been mystics and seers and forerunners and people who were drinking of the bliss and the powers of the age to come. This has always been a thing, okay? And there are mystical theologians who've studied a lot of this stuff out, and they kind of break trances down um, for, into basically two types, okay? Uh, the first type that we would be most sort of familiar with would be what's called an absorption trance, okay? Uh, will you stand up for me, sir? Stand up. Will you, can I? Yeah, help me out a little bit. Yeah. And could you step behind him? we get real close to him. Okay. Um, okay, so an absorption trance would be like this. I touch you. <laughs> there. See that? Well, he's got a chair. That doesn't work as well. Dick, will you come here? Dick, jump behind him real quick. Get real close behind him. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Quick, 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 quick. Oh, 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 oh. All the way down. Oh, 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 Okay, just leave him there. That's good. You can leave him there. 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 Okay. Okay. See how powerful that was? The way he just fell over like that? So, <laughs> so that's generally what we think of as an absorption trance, when somebody's just out, okay? A lot of times that's what we think of. And to think like absorbed into God. You don't know where you end and where he begins anymore. You're just, you just keep him there. Just keep him there. Keep Dick. Down, Dick. Down, 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 Dick. Down. <laughs> Powerful. Look, he fell over again. Powerful. <laughs> so we just think absorbed. Now that is one type of trance, but then there also is another type of trance called a concentration ecstasy. And in a concentration ecstasy, you're actually able, your senses are still working. Okay. In, in a absorption trance your senses fly out the window okay but in a concentration ecstasy your senses can even be heightened now the joy is still there the peace is still there the presence of god electric but you are able to know things maybe know things you couldn't ordinarily know supernaturally your your uh, things are heightened you might prophetically be aware of things that ordinarily you couldn't be aware of. Jesus knew the thoughts of the people when he was preaching, okay? Sometimes I'm preaching, I know people's thoughts, think clean thoughts, okay? So there's, uh, you know, there's different, there's different things. That, uh, or like um, sometimes it's like multitasking in the glory. Like if you're a ditch digger and you're digging a ditch, well, you, you guys do a lot of canal digging around here, don't you? So you're digging a little canal and all you see is the dirt in front of you, okay? And, and that's all you see. And that's the, the limitation of your vision, okay? But then imagine you were up on a mountaintop, right? You guys have mountain ranges in Netherlands, right? So you're up on a big mountaintop. And then you can see like broad visas, multiple things at the same time. You're taking in, like imagine if you weren't just limited to 10% of your brain, you were, the whole thing was open and, and like you just know things you shouldn't be able to know. All that's simultaneously, it's, you're outside of time and space um, or in a concentration ecstasy, sometimes the spirit of might may come on you and you're able to release healings and work miracles and that kind of thing. Um, Catherine Emmerich, who, do you guys ever watch Mel Gibson's The Passion? All right. Uh, that was a great, what, probably the only cool Christian movie I've ever seen. Uh, I, I, I know the sequel's going to suck, though, just telling you that. So anyways, um, so she, like Mel Gibson walked into, uh, uh, oh, you got all your churches will be behind it, though. So uh, Mel Gibson, because that's how we do it. So anyways, uh, Mel, uh, sick to the story, Crowder. So uh, Mel Gibson goes into like a library or something one day, and this book literally like falls off a shelf or something, and he based his whole movie off of this lady, Catherine Emmerich had these visions and these visitations where she was brought to the passion and she saw Jesus being crucified and all that. And he based the whole movie on that, which has reached so many people. It's really cool. Well, Catherine Emmerich was this mystic and she would go into these concentration ecstasies and she would just become electrified and she would just literally run and scale the columns of the church inside the building. And people are looking like Spider-Man and people are looking up. And so she just acted like she was dusting. 
if religious people ever give you a hard time, just act busy. As long as you have your shoulder under some irrelevant load, they'll leave you alone, okay? So weird supernatural things can happen in a concentration ecstasy. It could be like you just know things, prophetically know things that are like beyond your senses. Or you may, you may move in things, do things, okay? Like when I'm preaching, it's better if I'm in more of a concentration ecstasy because then I can speak intelligent Dutch for you. But if I'm laying on the floor like Dick over here, well, I mean, it's not helping you out a whole lot, right, in an absorption. But that's fine for Dick. Okay, now, now over here in the absorption uh, trance, okay, we've got two subcategories of trances, ecstasies, two, two types of absorption trance. You have complete and incomplete, okay? If Dick can still get up and eat his Stroop waffles and drive himself home, <laughs> ecstasy not yet complete. <laughs> but once Jop's wheeling him out of here in a wheelchair, driving him home, tucking him into bed tonight, ecstasy complete. So with an absorption ecstasy, it's about your will and your senses are just totally given over into the presence of God. And it's more about a complete overmastering of the glory of God in that sense, okay? And, um, and so John G. Lake gives a definition of that in, in that sense. He says, now what is a trance? A trance is the spirit taking predominance over the mind and body. And for the time being, the control of the individual is by the spirit. But our ignorance of the operations of God is such that even ministers of religion have been known to say it is the devil. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> One of the things that happens in, <laughs> in, in an absorption ecstasy, something kicks in called ligature. Everybody say ligature. Okay, that's a big word. You maybe just call it drunk. That's fine. You're not going to remember any of this. Ligature is the inability to do inward acts, like thinking, mathematics, out the window, all right? Um, in a ligature, everything just slows down, often accompanied by immobility, eventually the inability to speak, the inability to see goes pretty quickly, and the inability to hear. Now, this is all stuff we've seen anecdotally in charismatic meetings, but we didn't realize there are centuries and centuries of mystics in the church that have actually studied this stuff out. We didn't invent this thing, okay? This is not new. This is your, maybe you just think you're some weird, fringy little thing and you just, in, in, every generation thinks they're the first one to invent the Holy Ghost. I mean, you look at like the first great awakening that you had like in the UK and America and some of it hit here. Um, you had John Wesley, you had George Whitfield that have a thousand people packed in the church, another 2000 people out in the graveyard leaning, trying to hear what was going on. And it was crazy. And then, uh, so George Whitfield, he says, I'm going to get out of the church. I'm going to preach outside in the graveyard. I'm going to preach in the streets where the people are. And John Wesley, he's like, you can't preach in the streets. That's heresy. And Whitfield, he's like, well, watch and see. So he goes out. 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people, 40,000 people, 80,000 people. And so Wesley, he says, okay, I'll be a heretic too. So he goes and preaches. <laughs> now, most of it, they were actually in truth, they were getting kicked out of the churches, but the history books don't say it that way. So Wesley goes outside and he's preaching outside, you know, not as much rent out there. <laughs> and so he's out there and then like everybody's gathering and, and then, and here's the thing, his meetings were wild. And Wesley's meetings they, uh, the early Methodists, they used to call them the shouting Methodists, not because you'd get occasionally, Hosanna, but from miles away, you could hear them ah, just screaming. One brand new believer, he stands up on a, lo a log and he looks out. No, I'm sorry, a non-believer. He said they look more like a drunken rabble than the worshipers of God. In those days, they used to call manifestations the fits or 
enthusiasms was one of the words. People would write Wesley, do the fits continue? He would say, yes, every day, one after another, thunderstruck in the street. And he didn't mean, John Wesley, that sermon struck my heart like thunder. No, he meant let the bodies hit the floor. People would be hammered. And, and so that was just a very well-known thing in the early Methodist meetings. They literally, in one early Methodist meeting, I'm not making this up. I'm a preacher, but I'm not making this up. <laughs> they busted 11 rafters in the ceiling of the church. How do you do that? That's a crazy meeting. In John Wesley's own home church in Bristol, UK, I've been in there. I've seen the plaque. One time, the glory blew through there so strong that they, it was like a mosh pit or something. I don't know what happened, but they busted up every wooden pew in the building. How do you smash a pew? Crazy, right? So these were wild. So George Whitfield, he said, if I let people go that wild in my meetings, I'd never get anything done. So John Wesley sits down with Whitfield and he says, look, if this is God, don't touch it. So that afternoon, Whitfield goes out to preach. People start dropping all around him, going out in trances for hours. From that day forward, he didn't try to stop it. He didn't try to start it. He just let the river roll. At times, he'd have 500 people just mowed down like a Benny Hinn meeting 1700 style. <laughs> now, move on to the second Great Awakening. At least in America, I don't know about all your Great Awakenings here. I'm sorry. But in America, 1801, we had the second Great Awakening, which would be like a big like revival type thing, right? And so um, I like the word awakening better because uh, revivals come, revivals go. I don't want revival. I want reality. I want to wake up to what's already going on. Amen? So anyways, um, it's a lot less work too. So um, 1801 in a cornfield in America, in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky, um, um, you had 20,000 people. And for the first time, it wasn't unusual if somebody started to manifest or shake or something. It was unusual if you didn't. Unbelievers are just shaking under the power of God. Uh, preachers, that's a miracle. Preachers are just shaking under the power of God. One new believer stands up on a stump and he looks out and he sees 20,000 people just writhing under the power of God and then sporadically standing up on stumps and things across the fields, he would see like seven, maybe seven preachers just preaching at the top of their lungs and then he'd see 500 people just, just hit the ground. And so that kicked off the whole second great awakening that you have a lot of great, you know, historical revivalists came out of that and stuff. Now, in that move, they also thought that they were the first ones to invent the Holy Spirit. So they made up some terminology, and these ladies would be like shaking, and they'd literally be like bones out of joint the next day coming to the meeting. Their long you know, hair would whip like a horse whip when they moved. And so they made up names for it, and they called it the jerks. <laughs> 